beautiful state of Texas. Brimming with golden vistas and stunning countryside, this state has something for everyone to enjoy. Sunbathe on a lovely beach. Experience the Old West. See the Alamo. Enjoy the entertaining nightlife. Explore the countryside. If you do plan on braving the wilderness during your stay in Texas, be mindful of the following. Coyotes. Although a human death from coyotes is unlikely, they have been known to act with aggression towards people. Cottonmouth. Usually very timid. If a cottonmouth feels threatened, they will strike. If bitten, seek medical attention immediately. Cougars. These predators are extremely stealthy, preferring to strike their prey from behind. Don't travel alone. They are less likely to attack a group of people and be mindful of signs indicating their presence. Dogman. We hope you consider Texas for your next family vacation. Shannon is an investigator, she's a journalist, she's an excellent interviewer. She's been deeply immersed in this stuff for a while. She has a lot of knowledge. So seeing her come from the outside and approach this, you know, with her existing knowledge base, I think is refreshing and I think it's healthy. I'm very deep in this, so having, having an outside perspective is helpful. Yeah, so as far as Aaron goes, after spending time with him, I know that he's, he's in the community with other things besides cryptids, Dogman. But he's, his level of passion for Dogman, I enjoy it because he's much more well-read on it than I am. My, my side of things is coming in at it as someone who is not adept at all in the Dogman subject. Only having taken witness statements and hearing their encounters and how it made them feel and what they saw, I don't have any clue what these things are. 
they should not exist by all rights. There should not be sightings of these things anywhere. So I was not aware of essentially this dog man triangle in Texas prior to this. It, it started as research for an episode of a podcast that I produced. And it's centered on three sightings in the central hill country, Austin kind of area near Lake Travis that were all very similar roadside sightings or taking place near campgrounds. And when you put them on a map, you get a triangle of about 700 square miles. It's difficult to say how much time I spent on this project, but if I had to guess, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of four to 500 hours. I started the book about a month before we found out my wife was pregnant, and I finished it about a month before our son was born. So it, it definitely took a lot of time and energy, you know, away from her and away from preparing for, for our son to get here. It took a lot. Most people ask me how I got interested in cryptozoology. It's kind of an, an untraditional pursuit, I guess. So when I was eight or nine years old, I saw this TV show about Bigfoot, and it was just something inside me clicked because it was like, it seemed like a perfect synthesis of all of my loves. It was an animal, it was a monster, it was kind of all wrapped up into one. Certainly never planned to make a career out of it. I've just been very blessed. Well, I was early on attracted to monster movies. I loved anything horror or monsters. And when I was in third grade, I got a book called Strange But True, and it had chapters on Bigfoot, Yeti, and the Loch Ness Monster. And that really captured my imagination because I'm, I'm like, these seem monstrous, but you might see these in real life. You know, these were, it was strange but true. And ever since then, been fascinated with this subject. Well, it really began when I was a little kid, about five years old, and my mom and dad took me to Scotland. If you're gonna go to Scotland, where you gotta go? Loch Ness. And uh, my dad told me the story of the Loch Ness Monster. And I was like, oh my God, there's monsters. <laughs> and uh, that really got me intrigued and fascinating about the whole phenomenon of unknown animals. And one of the ones beyond just the Loch Ness Monster was this issue of what we might call werewolves. When I first heard the term dog man, you know, it was like, okay, you had to kind of equate that with a werewolf, but not with the supernatural powers. It's more of a cryptid classification, you know. But that's how these terms come into use. You know, somebody just coins it. You know, everybody kind of latches onto that as a way to describe some creatures that, you know, don't have a scientific classification. The more and more in the last few years I've been hearing about these stories of the dogmen. And I think when you look at these sightings of these creatures, they seem like a, a power machine. Go back to the Beast of Bray Road, if that's our archetype of a dogman, it was described as being about seven feet tall, standing upright and walking upright, and I think that's the main thing that we have to focus on here. Well, of course, you know, when you talk about a wolf-like creature that stands upright and can walk on two legs, you know, it becomes instantly horrifying because that gives it some characteristics that we associate mostly with our own selves. You know, we walk upright, we're intelligent, and we are the controller of our domain on this planet. This thing gets up and walks on two legs. It's more ferocious, more frightening has longer arms, broad shoulders. People always describe a wolf-like head, and I think that's the most common thing, as they say. And there are various descriptions. Some people say it looks more like a German Shepherd. There's a certain type called a fat head that has this big round head, and then there's some that are described as having kind of a longer muzzle or snout. What's really intriguing is the fact they're not skinny, they're not bony, so they are clearly getting their food from somewhere. sparked my interest in this phenomena originally was books like uh, The Beast of Bray Road and the film by Small Town Monsters, The Bray Road Beast. And then similar cases where you had recurring witnesses and recurring physical traits coming up again and again and again with people using the term werewolf or dogman. What got me interested in this in the Central Texas area was a personal encounter relayed to me by uh, very close friends, someone I knew very well, have no reason to distrust. 
someone who doesn't have the time in the day to make up stories and didn't want their uh, full personal details being shared, you know, in the course of my research because they were concerned about privacy. So this friend of yours, he doesn't want to be on camera. We might be able to speak to him, though, over the phone. Yes, and Trent, he actually just texted me a minute ago. He's ready for a call. So if you'd like, we can reach out to him now and talk to him a little bit. Yeah. Hello? Hey, buddy. What's going on? So you you have relayed your story to me a couple of times, but I was hoping you could talk, kind of talk through it again and just sort of break down the sequence of events. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was August 2018. You know, we'd be driving all day. Uh, we're starting to get late, and it's tree lined pretty much the entire way from where we got off 281 to Austin. Pitch black outside, can't see really anything except what's in front of you with the headlights. I see this figure on the side of the road, and as I get closer, and the headlights you know, really shine onto it, it was something I'd never seen before. You know, the best way to describe it is a large canine like animal. And I think the two biggest things that really just stick in my mind are, are its eyes, you know, not, not like regular animal eyes, and its teeth were just very large, nothing I'd really ever seen in person. They still looked like they had blood from the carcass that was eating on it. It looked like something out of a movie, how blood just drips from these very big teeth. And the rest of the family, you know, was on their iPads or phone or something, so... You know, I'm like, hey, did anybody see that? And no one did, but I thought about turning around, but, you know, something told me not to just, but it was, it was something I'll remember forever, for sure. Prior to the sighting, were you familiar with Dogman at all? Not really the lore or anything like that. I mean, of course, you hear myths of werewolves and whatnot, but no, I mean, nothing that was, I'd be out looking for it or anything like that. If you were out in the middle of the woods, just just you and that thing i mean do you think you'd be in a lot of danger absolutely one of the things that's intriguing is the the fact that we can see stories and woodcuts and things like that all over europe elsewhere which show images of what you would call an upright wolf Now, does that make that a werewolf or does it make it a dogman? And I think there is some sort of differentiation because if you look back at the sightings from, say, the Middle Ages, they just look like upright wolves. That's exactly what they look like. You have in this particular area sort of German and Czechoslovakian influence. You had a lot of German people that settled here. New Braunfels, Fredericksburg, Schertz, and some of these areas around here. So there's a blending of cultures. I've noticed investigating the dogman that you often find in areas where you have high concentrations of German and French and Western European settlers that you have these kind of modern dogman or werewolf types of traditions. And you could speculate as to whether some of this at least could be associated with, you know, different folkloric traditions that were brought over from Europe. Uh, the Rougarou, you know, there in Louisiana, you have that have French culture and now you have a kind of a werewolf influence there. So certainly every cryptid is a case of composite identity, meaning that you have a blending of different influences. Perhaps there is a mysterious creature at the root of the stories, but you also have misidentifications of known animals, mass hysteria, and unfortunately hoaxes. That becomes part of it too. So. The historical context of this phenomena is the aspect that really fascinates me because these stories, even though the fascination with them is fairly recent and we're hearing more about them in recent years, people have been talking about them for generations, over a century in some cases. And then you get into the mid-century, the 50s, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and we have sporadic newspaper reports from around the hill country about similar creatures. There's the Vider werewolf, the Gregton werewolf, there's the Beast of Bear Creek. The thing about the old newspaper articles, they're really fascinating, but 
especially back in those dates that you just mentioned, they took a lot of liberties with newspaper articles, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, they did have to sell a story. They had to sell newspapers and make headlines. And I think there probably is an element of that. Calf killing monster stalks Plum Creek sounds a lot better than strange dog seen in Lockhart. And we see that roll over even into the modern cases and the modern sightings. And, and that may go back to the werewolf being so deeply ingrained kind of in the public psyche. It's, it's an archetype that we're very familiar with. The behaviors that are described are still very similar. You still have stories of them standing by the wood line or rising from all fours into a two-legged stance and then walking away. Those attributes are consistent, but you do see with the old newspapers a sensational take on it, where you can tell they were trying to catch people's attention. What other old cases are there here in Texas? Going west from San Antonio, heading more out into West Texas, you have an area known as uh, Cleo, and there's a fixture there called Bear Creek. And there's a story of a shape-shifting, allegedly Native American shaman who could take on the form of an upright wolf or possibly a bear and would predate on people and animals and generally make life miserable. What's really interesting about the Beast of Bear Creek is that we have this carving called the Cleo face, which is done into the side of a limestone bluff. But some people will tell you that this face may or may not be a representation of the Bear Creek monster. And that probably goes back to the thought that it depends on with what lens you're looking at something through, right? If someone saw a demon or a werewolf. Another story which is not directly next to this one, but looking at a map of Texas is still relatively close, is the Bear King of Marble Falls. And that's actually going up further north towards Austin. And you have this old story which, again, seems to originate in the early 1900s. So a lot of these early cases go back kind of right to the turn of the century. But the story is that this large bear, ape, maybe dog-like creature came out of the woods, abducted a local farmer's daughter, and hauled her off into the mountains somewhere. And the people went out and they looked for her and they couldn't find her. And then the next morning she was found just kind of wandering around in a daze. And the story she told is of this upright monster that picked her up, took her away, and wouldn't allow her to leave. And so the people went to the place where she said she had escaped from. The townspeople opened fire and this creature collapsed, died right in front of them, and they never saw anything of it again. The story of the Converse werewolf is one of these really infamous historical cases that we have because, again, no one can trace an exact starting point to where this legend came from. But Converse is a small city northeast of San Antonio, and this story is supposed to have taken place anywhere from the late 1800s, maybe around 1900, and some accounts say as recently as 1960. Due to the nature of the story, I have a really hard time it could be that recent because we have so little documentation. According to the story, a rancher and his son moved to Converse, Texas, which is in Bear County, northeast of San Antonio. And the father had been either ex-military or in the Civil War, and so he was kind of a rough and rugged kind of guy, but his son was not. And so he told the son, I want you to go out by yourself and hunt for a deer. So he gave him a gun and he sent him out. So the son goes out, you know, without knowing what he was doing, and he went to this creek they called Skull Crossing. And when he was down there, uh, he had sort of a horrifying experience. So he comes back to the house, and he says, Dad, I don't want to do this anymore. And Dad's like, you know, what's the matter? The son said that he had seen some sort of a werewolf-looking creature. Well, of course, the father thought this was just some hokey story to get out of going hunting. He sent him back out and said, don't come home until you have a deer. And then by late evening, the son hadn't returned. So now the father thought, well, you know, getting a little worried. So he rounded up several of the closest neighbors and by lantern light, they went out searching. And when they got down to Skull Crossing, they came up on the bloody body of his son and it was being ripped apart by this creature that was hunched over him and the creature looked very wolf-like uh, canine snout and when they put the light on this thing it stood up and they took a shot at it and it took off running on two legs ran into the woods and this of course is a legend you know there's no no documentation to say it's true but as much folklore or legend goes, there, there can be a grain of truth 
in these stories and it's interesting that so many years back they described something that we would identify as a werewolf or even a dog man. Well, being native, of course, on, on, on growing up, you know, our folklore, you know, some of our tribes mentioned these things, they existed way back then. And being Apache, you know, I heard stories, but, you know, you don't want to think, you know, oh, they ain't real, but of course now, I understand these things exist. A reason I got into Dogman, I have personal friends and my ex-brother-in-law encountered Bigfoot. So I got into Bigfoot, listened to different podcasts, and you know, listened to people's encounters. And I heard some witnesses encounter Dogman. And then I heard people have sighting here in Texas. And I, and I did some research and, and looked up the first encounter in the state of Texas was by Seguin and Converse, Texas. I think the late 1800s, something like that, by the young man getting killed. As I got into it, my dad, he opened up and started telling me he saw him when he was a kid. Back then it was in the 50s, late 50s, it was not wooded, right? He's thinking now it's a dog man. But at first, his first thought was a timber wolf. Well, there's no timber wolves in Texas. Well, my dad told me he was face to face to this thing. It was like maybe 20 feet away. And it was huge. But now, since I'm talking about the subject, well, he was thinking it was one of those things on all fours. It was so big. In February and March of 1980, uh, there were a series of livestock killings up near Plum Creek, mostly calves. In fact, there was a rancher who lost maybe five to seven calves in a short period between February and March, uh, ultimately became known as the Plum Creek Monster. Uh, there was a gentleman named James Witter, I believe, uh, another rancher who claims he saw it and chased it. in the area? Uh, all my life, all except life? for when I went to Red River Valley for three years. I was over all the, the deal of Buffkin Farms. We had four divisions. I was over all of them, but I was mainly over the cattle and farming operation. We was working cattle on the Connolly place. I had three guys helping me. There was 84 cows there and 70 something calves at the time. Our dogs didn't come in. We used cow dogs to help pen and we went looking for them. We loaded the horses in the trailer and we looked up in front of us and there this animal was. It didn't run. It probably was maybe 300 feet in front of us. We went toward it and stuff. It didn't get in no hurry. It walked across the field, went through the war fence into the neighbors. I don't remember, but it was just a short while, probably a week to 10 days. Me and one of the boys that worked for me, Bobby Gott, we was over there riding and checking the cattle and stuff a horseback. And we got to this brush pile and Bobby said, your curb chain broke. I got off. Bobby said, don't move. I said, what's the matter? He said, you know that animal that we seen the other day? He said, there's two of them looking at you. Two of them? Two of them. I said, are they just sitting there or what? He said, yeah. He said, one of them sitting on his back legs, just like a dog, and the other one standing up. I finished my curb chain, got back on my saddle, I thought for a minute, I tucked my rope down. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to try roping it. Well, I picked out the big one. He took off. I took off, wide open, I mean. And I wasn't riding no deadhead horse either. I mean, I was riding a good horse. He went through that fence, and I don't know whether he went over it, whether he went through it. It was a net war fence and we didn't find no hole or nothing. Well, we got done got loaded, we worked the cattle and everything, 
was going out, and I told the boys then, I said, this is going to be quiet. I, everybody pledged that they wasn't going to say nothing about it. Okay. Well, two of them went to the beer joints. Well, in about four days, Lockhart, it was Plum Creek Monster this. Plum Creek Monster that. Texas is an enormous territory. It's over 268,000 square miles. You have environments from almost a desert, very dry and very arid, to swamp-like areas that are very humid, very hot, lots of mosquitoes. And then you have coastal areas. So this is a map that I put together based on eyewitness encounters from a variety of sources, generally going back over the last hundred or so years. And you can kind of see a concentration here towards the center of the state. If you start over here in the southwest area near Clio, going over to Fredericksburg and Kerrville, you have kind of a cluster down there. That's where we have the Clio face, the carving that we've talked right. about. And then we go over to Johnson City, Lockhart, and that's concentrated more in the Austin area. Austin, of course, we have the Brody Lane monster, Lockhart, the beast of Plum Creek. And then going down to Houston, the Houston area, there are numerous encounters out of Sam Houston National Forest, which is a tremendous amount of space, 164,000 some acres. It goes into three to four counties. It's huge. It's enormous. And then we have Conroe, Vidor, and Orange, which are very close to the coast, kind of getting down near Galveston in that, that general vicinity. If we go further up north, into the Dallas area, you have Paradise, Sanger, the Dallas-Fort Worth area itself. And then going a little bit south, you have Collin County. We have various encounters online, including one where someone actually took a shot at one of these creatures through a scope. Okay, so when you started to put these points together, mm -hmm. do you remember which points were kind of first and when you realized, oh, this is making it, you know, essentially the Dogman Triangle? That yeah, I mean, I started at home, essentially. I started yeah. in my backyard, and the first three encounters I really looked at were Lampasas, Fredericksburg, and Johnson City. Okay. And that formed a triangle of about 700 square miles. And that's where the idea of a concentrated area came from. And then I started looking at older newspapers and folk tales and talking to different witnesses. And the map just seemed to grow. That, that 700 square miles wasn't good enough anymore. Dogman was, we just thought they were these monster animals that we weren't supposed to mess with, as per my grandfather said, leave them alone. They'll leave you alone. Don't mess with them. So I guess he used to see them quite often. We had big barns, and sometimes there would be things in the barn making growling sounds. My grandfather had cows, lots of charlet, lots of pastures. I found one yearling way out, probably a half a mile in from anything. All of its bottom of its underside of its chin was no skin, no meat, and then the hole went on like this huge, and it was on its side. So obviously something carried it back there and ate all of its guts. Nothing ever hurt us besides scaring us to death, of course. 
This was when I was a young teenager. Me and my best friend, we were probably 12 or so. So we were all down at my uncle's house because my uncle and aunt were gone. It's just starting to get dark, but it's not dark. You can see everything. We were kind of like weirded out because they're big dogs. We're out in the pasture and we're barking just like a few minutes later towards the house. So we're in, we're all starting to weird out because everybody knows about the monster, you know? And then something starts hitting the side of the house. So we start hiding the little girls under the clothes in the closet. Their back door had a old wooden porch and then the door opened and it would open into a drawer. So the door could open and the lock was that drawer, but it would open about this far. Well, we're all in there trying to figure out, scared, crying, trying to figure out what to do. That door hits that drawer so hard. So then everybody's just screaming and crying, and I don't even remember if I was crying, but I probably was. All of a sudden, we hear my uncle's car, or you heard one bang on the porch, and then my uncle came in the house, and he was all yelling at us because he never believed any of it. If you were going to give a physical description of one of these creatures to someone who wasn't familiar with them, how would you describe it, or what might you say? Well, for me about the dog man, never in broad daylight. But like I say, that's why I was excited for you to talk to them because my friend Dawn, she laughed when she first, I said, I talked about it. And then one night she called and said, you thought it was a guy that was stalking you, but it was real tall and he only has one. One night I was sitting out in the breezeway with a mutual friend of JoJo's and I, and my dog started going crazy. I mean, in the front yard, just barking, barking, barking. So I went up to see what it was. And it was across the fence, probably about 40 yards from me. And I would have to say that it was maybe 11 feet tall. And the shoulders were very broad. I mean, they were like, but I, the eyes were as big as, as big as eggs. I, I can say that. And they were glowing, they were orange. The whole glowing eyes is what throws me off as to maybe they're, I don't know, of another world because I've never seen anything with glowing eyes. I realized that it was not something that I wanted to be around, right? So I grabbed the dog and I'm trying to get him in the house and I just panicked. I mean, I didn't know what to do because I know what I saw. I mean, that changed me. It changed who I, who I am today. When I go down my driveway, I, I'm a different person. I had kids growing up there and I raised two boys and, and they had the freedom of the woods. I mean, that was basically their playground. And I don't think I would have been as, as easy on them as going out there as I was if I would have known that they existed. Can you tell us a little more about the area that we're in right now and just kind of what it's like? Well, well, yeah, it's, uh, we, we're actually part of the hill when you get up towards Huntsville. This is, it's mostly flat plains to the ocean. So we're right at the beginning of the hill country out here, what they consider the hill country. My house is surrounded by national forest. Okay, I have like Lake Conroe to the south of me and national forest to the north of me. But I know too that a lot of the people that have original homesteaders out here, they all have stories about things in the woods, creatures and whatnot, big creatures like you see. And uh, yeah, they've, so they're still for a long time. Well, me and my mother were sitting here at this uh, same table. We were having coffee in the morning and I'm um, just sitting here talking and we happened to look over and uh, saw something start running out of the woods over there. And we have a lot of dogs out here, of course, we live in the country, so they just pass through, you know, the dogs. And um, so I said, that's pretty interesting. That's a big dog, huh, mom? Yeah. And um, I said, well, that, that's not a dog because it had very big shoulders and it had very small hindquarters and it didn't run, it galloped. And that's what I found so interesting. I said, Mom, that's not a dog. I don't know what it is. So we're sitting there looking at it, and Mom pulled out the binoculars because she watches a lot of birds out here. And we're looking at it, and I looked through it, and it looked to me like a hyena, a big hyena. So we're looking at it, I said, Mom, I think that's a hyena. And she says, well, I don't know. I've never seen one, so maybe it is. And we do have a lot of, what do you call those with the exotic animals? A lot of people have giraffes and stuff out here because we're in the country. And so we thought it was a hyena that got loose and just, you know, so I was worried because they're dangerous animals. So we're sitting here watching it and it's galloping across the field over there. Then when it got to the fence in the back over there, it jumped over it. 
you know, and it's a pretty high fence. I would say that's probably a four foot fence, and just in one bound, it just kind of went right on over. And I was like, well, that's pretty amazing. You know, I've never seen a dog do that either. So we went to all the places around here. And I say, do you have hyenas? And every one of them that we went all the way down the roads back here were all the, they said, no, we've never had one. So we were kind of stumped, huh, Mom? We don't know where that came from. Yeah, you know, Size wise, what would you compare it to? It was pretty big. Um, it's, it was probably, it was bigger than a German Shepherd, for sure. Um, not that, not, you know, real, real big, but it was bigger yeah. than a big dog. Is this, Mike, is that the same, is this the exact same fence that was here when you saw the picture leaf over it? Yes, correct. That fence right over the up on top there. Because that'd be really cool to show the height. Can we do that, Mike? Would sure, sure. So actually, that uh, it came out through here, right in here, and uh, I noticed it because when it got to about right here, I was like, "What is that?" Because it isn't a dog; it's pretty big. And then my mom. She goes, I don't know what that is either. And she pulled out her binoculars because she likes to bird watch in the morning. And yeah. that's when I got him and I saw it and I was like, oh my God, I don't know what that is. So he came on through here and basically he just started going this way because he went behind this rock and he was just like, like so I said, this is the path. This is the path right okay. here. So he was galloping. He wasn't really running. It was like a gallop. And that's what I found so strange about him. And he was really big, bigger than any dog I've so ever seen. So once he got behind this rock, I mean, I how would probably say. His, so at this angle, how much of his body was kind of? I mean, obviously he's not higher than that. But no, I'm, th I'm thinking wide. he was probably he was a big, probably about that big at the shoulders. Jeez. He was pretty big, that, and that's what caught us so uh, off guard because he was yeah. so big, you know. Yeah. And he wasn't running; he was galloping. And yeah, then I wonder he, how tall he would have been had you seen him up. Probably pretty big. I would yeah. probably say six or seven foot if he was standing up. And he just kept on going this way and just in one bound he just like right over the fence and then my mother said she saw him come in the other way a couple weeks after that jumping the fence and going that way so right through here where it's clear correct yeah that's i'd say that's about three foot yeah just one bound just jumped right on over and that's what i found pretty remarkable too because you know he didn't crouch down he just like kept on going and just like effortlessly so yeah went off in that direction and like I said that's where we have all them uh, the safari places and the people with that exotic animals so that was the first thing I thought and then we went back and uh, talked to the people all through there and they said no we don't have none of that yeah this is a lot more wooded than some of the areas that we've been yeah in for other parts of this and all that over there it's it's uh it's all the national forest you know they got a couple of, yeah Sam Houston they got a couple Huntsville, yes. Oh, another yes. state park, too. You're talking over 160,000 oh, oh, yeah. acres. Big place, big place. They call it the, what is it, the Piney Woods or something like yes. that, the Piney Woods? Big Thicket. Big Thicket, yeah. Big Thicket's been coming up a lot. So, yeah, it's very interesting that people have, uh, you know, all the old-timers have stories about strange things out here. You know, I didn't believe them until I saw that crit or whatever it was. Where's so, the next neighbor this way? Well, we had a gentleman, our neighbor, as you come down the driveway over here on the right-hand side going that way. His name was E.C., and he would tell us stories about big black creatures at night. He'd see him leaning against the fence upright. Um, I personally never saw him, but he's, when I, we first moved out of here, he'd tell us stories about that. And uh, They had a restaurant across the um, road here. It used to be called Squeaky's, and all the locals would go in there. That's where they'd go and just hang out and eat you know, uh, lunch and stuff like that, and they'd always be telling stories you know, there's, uh, about creatures out here. Personally, the only thing I ever saw was the, uh, I hear a lot of things, but the, um, that hyena looking thing is the only thing I've ever really seen. When they were like, oh, the creatures out here, did they have a, a nickname or a name for them that they would call them or just the creatures? No, you know, I, I don't think anybody's ever really named them, but everybody's talked about them out here. And that's been going back way before us. Yeah. You know, these people have been out here for 100, 150 years. Yeah, they're pretty, that's, you know, the stories I hear is oh, it's anywhere from uh, 8 to, to 11, 12 foot feet tall. Is there a known animal that you think could contribute to misidentification of dogman? Well, there are healthy populations of wild canids throughout North America. Coyotes have really come back in, in terms of very strong population, even in urban areas. You have a lot of coyote populations. Officially, there are not supposed to be wolves in Texas, but they have found DNA of red wolves in South Texas. And then you have occasionally feral dogs that can be kind of big and nasty. So some of that might be a little bit of misidentification. I think one of the most interesting possible angles is when you look at examples of mangy bears. When an animal suffers from scarcoptic mange, it makes their hair fall out, and in some cases, you know, they're entirely hairless. 
And if you've seen a picture of a hairless bear, it looks very monstrous and in some ways kind of looks werewolf-like. And of course, bears can walk on their hind legs, you know, or at least clumsily for short periods of time. So maybe misidentifications of mangy bears, maybe in some cases just big, scary, you know, feral dogs and wolves might contribute as well. You know, this is just a natural sort of reaction, especially from skeptics, is they're going to want to say it's a misidentification. Every species on the planet has a primary mode of locomotion. Humans, obviously, we're primarily bipeds. We walk on our hind legs, but we can crawl around on our all fours if we need to. Dogs and wolves and other animals can stand up briefly on their hind legs if they need to look around for danger or sniff something up high or whatever. When you're talking about the skeletal structure of canids, they're not really made to be walking upright. The, the quadrupedal locomotion is the natural movement of canids and their bone structure is built as such. And so I think it's very, very problematic when you're trying to make a case for a canid that's moving around like a human on its hind legs, even though people tend to throw in that detail, oh, it's got those, those backwards pointing legs or however they want to describe it. Uh, to me, that's not very convincing. It doesn't seem like something that would move very well on its hind legs. People who have these sightings truly experience something unexplainable. They saw something that they can't identify, something they can't quantify or put into rational terms. And when we start to theorize on that, we start at a baseline, which would be this is a flesh and blood. We know wolves, canids exist on our planet and this looks like one, so therefore we would theorize that this is one of those that's flesh and blood but has extraordinary abilities to get up and walk or is bigger for some reason. But when you start to play in the fact that we don't have a body, we've got all these sightings, you know, then sightings dating way back, legends and everything, that's when people play in other theories like it must be more paranormal Without question, the supernatural aspects of this dogman phenomenon far override anything biological or, or zoological in nature. Possibly the strangest case of all that I got to was close to about 20 years ago now. And I got to speak with a guy, a farmer, and he told me this story as to how he'd seen this strange creature, a dogman, prowling across his farm. The next morning, he found this stone on the floor and it had been carved with this weird looking face with these fangs and these pointed eyes and we could not put a, sort of an age on it. This was really weird because there had actually been a case like that way back in 1972 and it's called the saga of the Hexham Heads. Now Hexham is a little old village in the north of England. And two young boys were digging, playing in their backyard, and they found two of these carved heads, and they took them in the house. The next night, they saw in the house this dogman type thing running through the, the house, and the front door was thrown out, and the creature ran into the darkness. Now, this is fascinating because you've got two cases, one in the north of England, one in Paradise, Texas in the 20th century. And both angles of this relates to these stones. Now, what that means, I really don't know, but there's no doubt that there is this connection between ancient stones and the dogmen. In the traditional werewolf legends, werewolves were conjured, right? The traditional European werewolf was essentially the result of a pact with the devil. 
and there was usually some type of magical ointment or fur or a, a spell or something. It was all witchcraft and kind of black magic. And even in the Native American realms where we talk about skinwalkers and things, it, it's kind of a, a sense of a, of a conjuring, so to speak. So yes, I think these creatures, if they exist, or I should say these apparitions, entities, whatever you want to refer to them as, they are somehow conjured or brought forth either by us or by forces beyond our comprehension. Potentially, this dogman phenomenon could be the same exact phenomenon as people are experiencing with Mothman and flying humanoids, and even things like the goat man and some of these you know, other kind of anthropomorphic creatures. And are we dealing with some type of phenomenon that can change shapes and shape shift and perhaps appear to look different ways depending on the experiencer? And so I think that's the smoking gun right there is we have to consider that our minds are potentially capable of all types of processes that we may not be aware of. And I think the concept of the tulpa or the thought form manifestation, is it possible that we're able to project things into our reality and that these experiences can actually be shared and that somehow we're connected to a level where you and I might both see this manifestation. One of the common denominators that keeps coming up with Dogman is the psychological impact and that can also actually bleed right into a physical impact because of the fact that they essentially end up with a form of PTSD. They don't sleep, maybe they don't, they don't eat the same they're used to, they're, it's constantly on their mind. And they feel like they can't probably really talk about it with anybody. That's common. Everything you just described is really common in sightings of this nature where people are impacted afterward, not just, oh, I saw something strange and maybe there's an animal I didn't know about it. It, it goes beyond that. There's really an element of fear that seems to be almost intimately intertwined with this phenomenon. I think no matter what the phenomenon is, once you see something that's so out of the realm of what is supposed to be normal, in one aspect, people can get this insane drive to just learn more, collect more stories, that's the camp that I'm in. But then the other side of that is, you don't go in the woods, you don't want to read about it, you never want to talk about it, you may not even tell your own family that you've had this experience, right? So again, yeah. with that PTSD, yeah. it can go either way. I've spoken with one witness who has a really compelling story and he will tell you he's had repeated encounters with these things on his own property. And he oversees 100 acres of ranch land in the Dallas Fort Worth area and I asked him to come out and talk with us and you know be interviewed but for privacy reasons for his own privacy um, and then also for safety reasons he he said to me exactly I don't want anybody coming out on the property and getting themselves killed safety reasons specific to he feels that these are so aggressive that if we went out there we would be in danger yes 100% what's the closest he's been to that he said within 10 yards. 10 yards? There's an account, it's written about in the book, but he said it charged him, and he wasn't sure if it was a bluff charge or if it was actually after him. And he put multiple rounds into it, which knocked it on the ground, and then he put several more rounds into it as it was running away. Is his story. And a big bag of milk right there. Mm -hmm. And this guy also has a military law enforcement background. He's got plenty of training. And so to hear someone like that, that kind of a background and that kind of a demeanor describes something like an upright wolf. It, it, it's, it's striking. So how does he go about his daily chores and ranch life? When you're out on a property this large, most people that are out there regularly carry a firearm anyway. And I asked him during our interview, have you changed your routine at all or the way you manage your property? And aside from carrying a rifle most often now instead of just a sidearm, nothing else has really changed for him. This guy is from the Texas Hill Country. He's used to being out in the wilderness. He's used to being around large and dangerous animals. These are people that don't scare me. But his daily life now is completely changed. Because now he's, he's choosing, I need a shotgun along with my sidearm. One of the things that really intriguing is that when people have these encounters, it really changes people. 
because nobody really expects to see a Bigfoot or a Dogman or a Loch Ness Monster, but sometimes somebody does. And it really does impact on their lives. And I do mean their, their lives, not just a bit of it. To see something which everybody has said, these things aren't real. You know, there's nothing to it at all. It's just jokes and stories and it's X-Files stuff, you know. And it's not. To see something like a dogman standing right in front of you, say at midnight with this creature salivating and staring at you, that must be terrifying for people. And I can easily see how this would destroy people's normal mindset. I've talked to a few witnesses that were certainly traumatized by these encounters. And in some cases, yes, they did not want to go into the woods or did not want to go alone or stayed out of the woods for years. And I think when a witness does illustrate that emotional reaction or that they, you know they've been traumatized, it kind of supports what they're saying. You know, this isn't something they're just kind of manufacturing or making up. Something happened. They saw something. Tex, I really appreciate you coming out and talking to us. Um, your name has come up a lot in our research, and so I wonder if you could talk to us about this phenomena and some of your experiences with it. Sure, uh, no problem. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Y'all have to excuse me because when I start talking about this kind of stuff, the, the, the first encounter, I don't care how many times I've told it, it's 80 something degrees and I'm getting goosebumps. The way I grew up since about the age of 12, I was carrying a gun. And I, you know, I was hunting and fishing and trapping. When I was 16, I'd been rabbit hunting. And I was coming back home and, and I was walking on a white gravel road and we lived down in the valley. The sun had, was just dipping below the, the ridge, but it wasn't below the horizon yet, so it was plenty of daylight. And I'm walking along, and our fence borders the road this way. So I was fixing to jump the fence, take a beeline to the house. This thing comes busting out of the brush on my left-hand side, about 25 feet away. It runs across the road in front of me, and the, the, it dove over our five-strand barbed wire fence, hit the ground, went down to all fours, and disappeared in the long grass. The image that I have froze in my head was when he was mid-stride, turned his head, and growled, snarled at me, you know? When he froze, he was in a runner stance. Not when he froze, but that's the image I have in my head. I can draw it and everything. He wasn't wooly, you know? He was more of a slick-haired fella. I remember the hair hanging down off his arms about this far, but it was, you could see the skin underneath. It was kind of thin. And that's how he was, you know, covered. But except when it came to his head, starting about between his ears at the top of his head where I wish my hairline was still was. And I could only call it a mane. That's what it looked like. And he went down his shoulders and down his back in a V. Okay, now that was thick, what I thought was a mane. He was black, with some gray or silver mixed in. But he didn't have that long, narrow wolf snout. It was shorter and blunt. The ears, his were lower on his head, but they were pinned back. Like when an old horse or a dog gets upset, he'll pin his ears back. That's what it was. And he turned his head and he growled at me. You talk about ice water in your veins. You know, I, I, was, I was frozen. I didn't have the wherewithal to even run, you know. And I'm sitting here with rabbits hanging off my belt. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm dead. He just run off. You know, like I said, jumped, dove over the fence, hit all fours, and he was gone. When I got home, I walked in the back door, I walked in the kitchen, and I pretty much just collapsed in a kitchen chair, and I put my gun on the kitchen table. Big no-no in my house. Mama had a rule, no guns in the kitchen. And she goes, oh, my God, what's wrong with you? You're white as a ghost. And I tried to tell her, but I could not talk. Now this encounter set me back on my heels for about six months. I didn't go anywhere. 
and it won't go anywhere. If I had to go to my sister's house or if I was over at my sister's house and had to come home after dark, it was in a dead run. If I had to go to the barn, I didn't care what time of day it was, I was loaded for bear. My daddy and my mama was always asking me, what are you doing packing a shotgun to go feed the pigs? Well, you know, snakes. <laughs> you know, something like that. For That went on for about six months. So I started going back out again. So I go, there's this area that I used to hunt a lot. I was coming up through the creek and I heard something walking in the brush. At this point, I'm having flashbacks. What am I fixing to run into? I said, look, if you don't say something, I'm gonna shoot. And it stopped. I fired around off in the air. That may have been a mistake. <laughs> this thing sounded like a bull coming out through, the, through that brush. All hell broke loose. I ain't too proud. I'll tell you right now, Tex took tail and he run. All the way back to the house. I never looked back. If this critter was fixing to get me, I didn't want to know about it. You regret having the dog man encounters? No, but, you, you know, I did for a while because if you do open your mouth about it, your credibility is shot with a lot of people. But uh, no, not anymore, I don't. Um, this came from a very good friend of mine. He's actually one of our trackers out in the field. Um, he recorded this off his property and he just had an audio recorder sitting out because they'd had some activity. I honestly do not know what it is. I think they may have a dog man in the area. Um, but anyway, shall we? Please. Determined yet, and I've listened and I've listened and I've listened. Between the howls, there's a low, almost sounds like a grunt or a growl under there. Can you play it one more time for us, please? You can I hear didn't it. even pick up on that until you said that, and now it just stands right yeah, out. You can hear it very clearly. In terms of someone capturing one of these things, audio, video, where are we at as far as that goes? Admittedly, we don't have a lot. Most of the uh, evidence that we have comes in the form of pictures of footprints, some claw marks, a few audio clips uh, from here and there. I do have a video that was sent to me by another gentleman in Texas in a very rural area. And this is of some kind of animal moving across the center frame and then doing what looks to me like either standing up on two legs or admittedly possibly sitting down and turning to face the camera. And it's shot from quite a distance. It's about 100 meters on an iPhone. So, you know, you, you have what you have. But if you look at this, we've got this shape kind of loping through the field here, moving in a really strange fashion. Maybe it's an animal that's injured. Oh, right I there. see that. Yeah, right there at the end. I can see where you could get the impression it popped up on two legs, but because the tree line is dark and that is a dark object, then you don't know if it just, as you say, turned away from the camera. It is so blurry though, that's unfortunate. It is, and we're dealing with, and this is the highest resolution we have for it, so we're dealing right. with a very low quality clip. But what we can see in spite of that is the fact that something large is moving through the foreground here. It's moving in a strange way. And this is in a place where there aren't supposed to be wolves. There may be some wild cats out there. Uh, there aren't supposed to be bears out there, at least not in great numbers. So the list of likely candidates for this creature is fairly short. 
Now as for what happens after this video, because it cuts off pretty quickly, um, I don't know. I don't know why he stopped filming when he did. He says he's seen these things fairly regularly. So for him, this is not a extraordinary event. This is almost a daily occurrence. Um, okay, so size-wise, did he go out? Did he do any kind of size comparison to figure out uh, what we're looking at here, maybe size-wise? According to him, gentlemen, he goes by John. According to John, these things are somewhere between seven and nine feet tall when they stand on two legs. On four legs, he describes them as the biggest dog I've ever seen. All right, so we've seen another, unfortunately, slightly blurry video, but what other evidence is there out there for Dogman? So we have footprints, uh, pictures of footprints, several of which have been sent to me by the same individual. Um, there are others that I've received from the San Antonio area, and then we have some audio clips that are definitely canine in nature. They sound like some kind of a canine animal, either howling or, or screaming, as some witnesses describe them. So we do have various pieces of evidence that, when we put them all together, start to form a picture. It's just a very blurry picture. It's like a lot of these things, you know, that swirls around some stories and you can see landmarks and there's people that are very certain about this stuff, but there's no smoking gun, you know, and there's no, there's no hospital report, there's no newspaper article, there's no sheriff's report filed, and those things would actually definitely be done if there was murders because it doesn't matter what killed the person, there's gonna be these files. But of course that segues into a conspiracy where it'll be explained away by saying that, well, those reports were redacted or taken or suppressed and the news wasn't allowed to print the story because these, the officials knew that it was a Bigfoot or knew that it was a werewolf or a dogman. And therefore that's why we don't have documentation. I have a, a handyman business, but not strictly handyman. I build houses, remodeling, uh, add additions. I mean, not, in other words, from foundation to the finished roof product. And I, I cater around the hill country, and, and I have a lot of these old customers. These are well-established customers. They're real particular who they have around. And by, I started asking questions. At first they're quiet and eventually they wind up opening up. And people have told me they have seen sighting out of La Paz, Texas, west of Killeen, different area. But on this incident, a gentleman got killed. Of course, the sheriff went to do a report, you can look that up, and say it was a mountain lion. The cat did it. Well, the captain, does it says in an article, the captain did it, no, it was not a big cat, it was something else, and left it alone. I don't know why, one day I was talking to my father-in-law and I asked him about this, you know, about dog pen. And right away he opened up. My, my father was retired Marine. Well, he's a good friend of the captain of Division of Wildlife. One month before this incident happened to this young guy, got killed, they had reports. There were sighting in that area around the Brazil River. So what they did, they got on the river at night, had cameras connected around the boat, and had the boat on a trolling motor, quiet. And according to him, his buddy was telling him they were going along, and they heard something on a, on a bank. And when he heard something, they fire up the spotlights. It was the dog man. And they caught it on video. It was one month prior for that gentleman got killed. Now up to date, what's going on now in my area. On the 21st of this month, the gentleman reported a Bell Helic helicopter. There was no signal, no lettering, all blacked out, landed in our area. You always hear when the situation is getting extreme or getting out of control, that's when these helicopters start coming in. They're keeping quiet about it. Five people went up missing. Well, this lady, she had puncture wounds back of her neck, puncture wounds back of her shoulders. They claim it was suicide. Well, there was another one, a lot of the female, they found her dead. They didn't mention how she died. 
And then later on, they found a gentleman. And about a week ago, they find, uh, I found a Hispanic woman. And they still didn't say what she died of. There's still one missing. You see it, they spin it or try and cover it up and bring something ridiculous like that. She killed herself. So for you, because you go out and you do this as much as you can with all the other things that you're doing, when you're actually out there and you put yourself in one of those six situations that you just mentioned, would you want to have those encounters or is that on the no list for you? It's a scary thought, yes, but no, I absolutely would want to see it. And, you know, whatever happens, happens, but I wouldn't avoid the the possibility that I could see one it would answer certainly answer a lot of questions and it would certainly be worth it I think well for me yeah I mean that's why I do what I do you know I'm sort of gung-ho for all this stuff you know I like to go out into the woods and the lakes and the caves and all that looking for all these different creatures and I'll keep doing this as long as I'm able to when you get to these really weird cryptids like Dog Man, um, it just doesn't seem very viable scientifically. I mean, the physical descriptions, the behavior that's described, some of the other residual weirdness that seems to be associated with it. So I'm not saying it's not worth pursuing because I think uh, any reasonable person can pursue a mystery and try to gather more evidence and data. But in terms of cryptozoology, which is what I do, it just doesn't seem like something that I would, you know, put a lot of time and effort into, and therefore I haven't. I've investigated a few cases, but it's not high on my priority list in terms of things to investigate. thing about this experience and researching this phenomenon, going on this journey and talking with these witnesses and becoming so, so invested in this story is the things that are consistent and recurring. And it's not just the descriptions of these animals or whatever they are, the way that people respond to these things and the way that they feel after these encounters seems to be the most common denominator. But then when you look at Texas as a whole, the history here is so diverse and the folklore goes back so far. You have the European settlers who brought the original werewolf stories with them from Germany and from England, for example. But then you also have Native American populations that have their own stories that have been around for much longer. You know, you could argue that it's had so much energy concentrated in it for so long that we're seeing some kind of manifestation. But again, then we go into what are these things? Animals, not animals? a mix of something. After talking to all these people, writing the book, it's not misidentification. This is, whatever it may be, this is what they're seeing, and across the board, whatever it is, it's Dogman down the line. What's, what's the best evidence that you've come across? I think I, I generally agree with you. It's not misidentification. I, I don't think every case we can necessarily say that. Some of these are probably a dog. Maybe a dog with sarcoptic mange, maybe a canine mix that has several different breeds involved, and that's why we get this really ghastly appearance. But there are too many cases that fall outside of the natural order of things, like you said, that just don't look like animal misidentification. So some days I think what we have is an unidentified species, maybe one-offs, hybrids, mutants. That's why we see them rarely. They don't reproduce, perhaps. But on the other side of the coin, you have the inexplicable and we can't separate them from one another, but it's hard to look at them in the same box. So when I say I think there's more than one thing going on here, I think there's more than one thing going on here. Things like glowing red eyes, and people are very specific that the glow is coming from within. It is not an eye shine of any kind that adds another layer to this being something else. I don't know that I can say that I think that they're flesh and blood. It's, it's so difficult, I go back and forth. I'll read three or four cases that are roadside encounters where it seems to be interacting with roadkill and then it stands up on two legs and walks off into the brush. To me, that just seems like something an animal will do. You know, it'll notice a vehicle, it'll stop what it's doing and it'll move away. But then again, we have these supernatural cases and if, if we can't fit them all into one category, 
how many things are going on here? I guess that's where I'm at now, is, is, is this just one thing? Or are we looking at multiple phenomena, multiple things that are overlapping with each other? The amount of time and effort that went into this project, I think, well, I know subverted my expectations by a lot. I knew it was a big undertaking because when you're looking at this many resources and this many witnesses, it's gonna take time to compile all that information. But I'm, I'm surprised, I even surprised myself with how little sleep I got. <laughs> so I'll get there at some point. At some point there will be a, a nap. But right now, there's still, there's still a lot to write down. There's still a lot to talk about.